In this episode, we are talking all about engaging our youngest language learners and planting the seeds of proficiency early on. I'm joined by Carolina Gomez, an elementary Spanish teacher in Massachusetts, who shares her tools and techniques for drawing young learners into the language learning process. Not just for elementary teachers, we can all take something away from this discussion. So let's jump in. Are you a language teacher looking for some reassurance that what you're doing in the classroom is on the right track? Or maybe you're looking for some ways to teach even more effectively. If you're one or the other or somewhere in between, you've landed in the right place. This is the World Language Classroom Podcast with your host, me, Joshua Cabral. You're about to get tips, tools, and resources so that your students continue to rise in proficiency and communicate with confidence. Let's jump in. Vamos, allons-y. Hello, my friends. Bonjour, mes amis. Hola, mis amigos. Welcome to the World Language Classroom podcast. I am Joshua Cabral, and as always, I'm incredibly thankful to have you here and appreciate the fact that you listen to this podcast so that you can look at your teaching and be confirmed that, you know, you're doing great stuff or you can change a little bit based on what you're hearing from other teachers and modify. So thank you for being that awesome teacher that you are. Take one second, look down at your phone, wherever you're listening to this, make sure you are hitting subscribe or follow so that you get all these episodes as they come out. Always helpful if you can leave a little rating or review as well, because it helps other teachers jump on board and hear these episodes as well. So today we are going to be talking pretty specifically about teaching language to the early learners. And by early, we're talking sort of pre-K, uh, preschoolar depending on where you are, and going through, you know, third, fourth grade, maybe. But even though we're focusing there, I have learned in my own teaching journey, having taught early learners, that so much of this is applicable to older language learners well through high school, because it's just good teaching. It just might, might look a little different. To help us kind of navigate this whole experience of teaching early language learners, we are joined today by Carolina Gomez. And if you have ever searched on YouTube or somewhere for, you know, I want some ideas for teaching young learners, you may have come across her videos. She also has great videos on social media and where you could see what she is doing. And she has an incredibly engaging personality, which makes her so wonderful for teaching these early language learners. And I am just so happy to be able to have this time with her today. So Carolina is from Colombia, and she started her teaching career in Colombia, so about maybe a couple of years, three or four years, and then she came to the United States. And she's been teaching here for the better part of 20 years, and she teaches in a school in Boston, Massachusetts, uh, called the Buckingham Brown and Nichols School. And I would love to just welcome you on into the podcast, Carolina. Hola, hola. Hola, Joshua. Thank you. Thank you so much for um, inviting me and your introduction about me. It's impressive. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're, so you're impressive. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. So I'm happy to be here. I, I admire a lot of what you do and how you always give back to the teaching community. So thank yeah. you so much for inviting yeah. me. Yeah. So I gave a little bit of an introduction about how long you've been teaching, where you teach, that you're a Spanish teacher, but can we just hear why do you enjoy teaching? Why is it something you like to do every day when you get up? Yeah, it's interesting because, um, you know, when I was in that time of life where you have to choose um, what you want to do in your life, um, I didn't want to be a teacher. Mm -hmm. So I always say that I made it into the teaching field by accident <laughs> and it was like a really good accident um, <laughs> uh, because I don't see that's what I have been doing my whole life and I, I don't see myself doing something different. I really like, um, you know, like I feel um, blessed and lucky that I have have the opportunity of always teaching younger children. Um, I really like the energy that they actually give me, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, you know, when I teach them. So I always look forward to to that, to the excitement that they have. Um, that's what 
keeps me going. So we're going to talk about teaching these younger students, these early language learners. And can you talk to us about the benefits of starting early at a young age? Well, I can say that um, the process actually feels more natural. Um, and, you know, like learning a language is not only about learning how to speak a language. I feel like children at an you know, early age can be exposed to things like empathy, uh, you know, like embracing the world and other cultures with curiosity, being respectful and tolerant. And those are skills that uh, children can develop early on, you know, when they are exposed to um, or they learn to start learning a language um, early. Uh, you know, it's also growing up knowing that um, the world is big, that there are different cultures and languages. Um, it's getting them ready for the world to be um, citizens of the world, you know, for some students, our programs might be the only space where they can um, hear a different language. So why miss that window, you know? Right. Uh, many times when we hear people advocating for early language programs, the focus is on that linguistic process being important early on. So I appreciate your really putting the focus on the culture and understanding culture right away from early on. So thank you for that lens. Sometimes I think when it comes to early, specifically early language learning, although I will now probably say early culture and language learning, so sometimes there is a question or fear of adding a language in too early before their first language is totally developed. So what has been your own experience uh, raising your children, I believe, bilingually? Um, and what is the response to that? Well, thank you so much for asking that question. Uh, for me, it has been the experience has been very positive. Um, yeah, we live... Or I'm I'm very um, lucky that actually my husband supports uh, you know like that our children um, have the opportunity to learn another language and are growing up bilingual. But it has been an experience filled of joy. You know, like they always have uh, to choose from. It was actually at the beginning when they were younger. Now they are eleven and sixteen. Uh, it was always um, we have a lot of funny moments where they will meet up words and they were like moments to celebrate like for example my daughter to say moon she would say muna and things like that but right now she's at a point when she knows what it is and she can go uh, like anytime she goes to Colombia she's able to interact with my parents and and you know like keep learning from my own culture too when she goes there but I can say for me it has been positive and yes, there have been times, you know, when they were younger that there was so kind of like confusion, but it was all part of like growing up bilingual. It's going to happen, you know, but then it, it's going to get to a point when they will understand and their brain will process um, the languages. What is it about the younger learners that draws you to teaching them? I really, really feel connected with that. Uh, this age group, you know, like, um, I really enjoy the energy, you know, they have the excitement that they bring to class. And I can say most of them, I'm not going to say all of them, but most of them, you know, like when you bring like a, something like a magic box prop to class, they will want to know, and you can see the smiles. Well, right now you can see the smiles, but with their eyes, you know, and you can hear the yes. jiggles. We call that um, smizing when you can oh. see in their eyes that they're, they're smiling. That's what I call it in my classroom. I love that because you can now read eyes, right? The expressions right. through the eyes. Mm -hmm. So that's really awesome. Um, you know, I love how spontaneous they could be. Uh, when I'm walking around the school, I suddenly hear a group of students singing one song that they learned from the class, or they say, oh, la Carolina. So I, most of the time, young learners just, they fill your heart, which is beautiful moments. Um, so yeah, I can say like, if I always have to choose, I can say that I can, I mean, I could do different age groups, but um, the little ones are the ones that I, I really like, so. I did a, a stint of about 10 years of teaching high school. And for the last 15 years, I've been doing middle and elementary myself. So I have first through eighth grade now. And 
I completely hear that excitement piece. They're just less inhibited. You know, they don't question, right. you know, it's they they accept it as just a fun game and they don't even realize the language that's happening. That's so true. Yeah, everything feels a little bit more natural. Yeah. Let's talk about some sort of technique and procedure things in the classroom. So engaging learners at that level. That's when when I see your videos and your social media clips, I'm so drawn in. So mm-hmm. I know that you have a strong grasp on engaging these young learners. Uh, so how do you do that? What does that look like? Well, first, I feel like if you want to engage um, your students, you you need to find you know way, uh, ways you know, to get to know them first and then, you know, get to know what excites them to um, find ways to connect uh, with them. And then I feel like then you can find, as I said, ways to um, how to bring mm-hmm. that uh, to mm-hmm. the class. Could you um, say just for an example, like what has been something, a theme that has really connected to students where you said, I know they'll be interested in this and this is a good hook for them? Sometimes it's that actually, if you're asking me about a theme, sometimes it's keeping your ears open and see what they are actually talking about too. Uh, is that something that I can say, oh, this is a, you know, like, yes, keep your ears open and and, and listen a little bit about that. Um, I can say that's a unit or something that has been going really well in my classes is the, talking about the monarch butterfly migration and finding ways to bring the language to them because they are all excited because it's happening in science and they actually have the caterpillars and they have it in different. So I know it's something that is happening in the school and they are seeing it and excited about it. So I, I, I find a way to bring that to class. Mm-hmm. But also, as I said, listening a little bit about what they are talking, um, uh, but like what, what's going on, right. you know, when they are with other, um, other mm-hmm. classmates. I had a kindergartner last week, actually. Um, this kindergartner came to my class very excited because he lost a tooth. So I had my whole lesson plan ready, but we actually yeah. stopped. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then we started talking about, you know, about yeah. the, the the teeth that they had mm-hmm. lost. And it was an opportunity to start yeah. counting mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. with them. And they were all excited about that and very quickly putting their masks down and showing like, look, look at this. So that was a way to bring language alive and connected with them. So I can say, yeah, they can. So I remember when I was when I was teaching high school, the focus would end up being, oh, you're getting your driver's license <laughs> or you're getting your first job. And that was the language. And I remember when I first started teaching, like first and second grade, we had to learn I lost a tooth. <laughs> you know, it's just it was language that they needed. They didn't have to learn to say I'm getting my driver's license. And the 16 year olds did not learn to say I lost a tooth. But yeah, I remember. Oh, Wow. Yeah, I wasn't anticipating the <laughs> I lost the tooth language. Right, so yes, important to them. Yes, so kind of like explore a little bit their world, you know, and know what's happening for mm-hmm. them and bring that to class. Yeah. And so when you're making language comprehensible for younger students, uh, that's where I always see you shine. And I want to kind of get into your head a little bit. And how do you make sure that language is comprehensible to students because I know that you speak very little English to them. So you have found the ways to do it in Spanish that is very comprehensible. So can you talk to us a little bit about how you go about that? Well, first, um, and, and I feel like it's actually nothing new. Like we language teachers, you actually a lot of visuals, right? And a lot of body language. Uh, so making sure that I do that um, a lot with them. I have been also, um, I actually have some signs that I use in my classes and some questions, you know, like I, I, I to make sure that they actually understand them. Um so it's also making sure that they feel safe in the class to let you know that they are not um, understanding. So it's also, it's not only about, you know, like the visuals and the body language, but it's also make sure that the space is a safe place for them to let you know, like, oh, please go back. I'm not getting this. Um, so in class, we do something like that. I ask, si está claro o no está claro? 
and they actually show me uh but of course that goes along as i said you know like using body language and 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 a lot of language and i really like using you know like different games um that go along with the theme that i'm doing in class too so it's more like a little bit of like prepping them um, and giving them the heads up of what's going to come up later in a story that we're going to be doing in class. What sort of objects do you use to make the language without having to translate? You know, I know that I love your puppet videos. Those are the best things ever. When I need to put a smile on my face, I put on a puppet video. <laughs> so how, how have you used those in your classroom? Uh, let's see. The puppet always works, you know, with the younger students. Um, I feel like the puppets can help you create silly situations if I have to talk about one prop. Uh, and, you know, like, for example, with the puppet, we like I like to show the puppet to my kindergartners and then the puppet is counting, but it's not counting, you know, like in the right order. And then... Um, you know, like if they hear uno, dos, tres, cinco, then I will say, <laughs> está correcto or no, está correcto. Mm -hmm. You know, so they can actually hear. Um, so the idea is to also, um, yeah, like make it also a little bit silly and fun. Um, so they can, um, you know, like feel that they are, it's, as I said, it's fun, but the focus is not that they mm -hmm. are, for them, for me, it's like to use the language as much as I can, mm -hmm. but for them, it's more like, oh, I'm hearing the language, but I'm, I'm having fun. And it's, they kind of forget about that too. So make it natural, you know? Right. Yeah. I, I have two puppets that I use uh, in my classroom as well. And I teach French and Spanish. And so in my, my French classes, it's the same puppets, but one, the <laughs> puppet, she's from Senegal in Africa. And the other puppet, uh, he's from Quebec in Canada. And they know that they don't speak English. So if they want to talk to them, they have to speak the language. And, you know, those are very typical for my younger students. But I, I often have students through seventh or eighth grade. And they will once in a while say, can Luke come out? Can Sophie come out? Oh. <laughs> you know, and it's sort of because we think, oh, that's only for six and seven year olds or five year olds. But they they often You're ask right. for it as well. You know, <laughs> mm -hmm. you are mm -hmm. right. Totally right. Like any age group can benefit, you know, from them. And especially like your puppets, I feel like, as you're saying, they know them from before. Mm -hmm. So they they have like, a, they already have like type of a relationship mm -hmm. with your mm -hmm. puppet. Yeah. And they create the story along each year. You know, they, they decide, okay, now they have brothers. Now they have a sister. These are the activities they like to do, you know, <laughs> and uh, it changes every year, you know, and I'll be like, oh, you know, does she like to play basketball or does she like to dance? You know, they decide, they create the story behind that. So when you're planning out your classes, what does sort of lesson planning look like uh, when you're teaching, say, a kindergarten class? I always make sure that, you know, like I have like a unit uh, when I know that I have the goals clear, you know, and, you know, sometimes the goals change a little bit or have more than one goal. Like sometimes they're only linguistic goals, but sometimes there are also cultural goals in my, in my lesson. So having that clear, it helps me later to just develop, um, the different, um, lessons. Uh, and of course, like I make sure that in every lesson I have a warm up, you know, it's usually like a greeting song or if they're coming to my classroom, I, um, I make sure that there is like, um, a greeting, you know, at the door that we use. So thinking about what I'm going to do to get them ready to be in my class is that warm up, right? Uh, like I can say like maybe, you know, I like thinking what I'm going to put in my lesson, in my uh, plan that I share with my second and third graders, because I always show them what we're going to do in class. It's kind of like a message. So it's also stopping and thinking like, oh, how am I going to make this comprehensible and for them? Um, uh, so yeah, thinking about that with my second and third graders and also thinking about the activities that, you know, like are the core of my lesson. Um, how am I going to engage them? Um, you know, in the unit with different strategies that I'm, I'm going to use uh, for this. But I, I have to be honest, because I have been teaching also for a while. This is more like 
it requires less thinking a little bit for me. Um, it becomes more natural too. And then making sure that I have, you know, like in my lessons, I'm finding ways for students to feel connected. Um, and then, um, you know, I wrap up at the end of the class. It could be like just, um, you know, it could be just like ending the class through a simple game that reviews what we have been doing in the class, a question about story. And then um, at the end, we say goodbye with a song and I tend them, I give them, how do you say this? Like, I'd say gracias. <laughs> yeah, I thank them for, you know, like coming to my class and then they thank me for teaching them. It's just like a nice way to close the class. So you mentioned uh, when you said your goals that you have a cultural goal. Can you just give us an example of what a cultural goal is that you might have for a class? Well, okay, I'm going to tell you about something that I have been sharing with my third graders. We have been talking about the Año Viejo tradition, you know, in my classes, it's, which is an um, old year tradition in Colombia. It's, um, it's kind of like a doll, I guess. Now they are tiny, but that little doll represents all the bad things that happen in the year, right? And you burn it on December 31st in the middle of the night to just as um you know like something that represents the bad things and then burning that will get rid of the bad things so we have been talking about that uh in my classes so there is a cultural you know like in that story that i'm teaching them that's the cultural goal for them to understand why we do that and how we do it and do you have them actually engage in maybe making one or creating one in any way i they make a paper uh -huh. one this year, I wanted to go ahead and try to make more, a little <laughs> more real world, but it actually takes right, a little bit of mm -hmm. preparation from my mm -hmm. side. Uh, and with the limited time, mm -hmm. I only see my students twice right, a week. Right. So I, when I do something like that in class, I have to like, prep right. a lot. But they do make a paper one, and we do pretend that it's like a you know like a video mm -hmm. with some fire right, right. and. We just say, oh, Feliz mm -hmm. Año Nuevo. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's a, the, I was not aware of that tradition. So thank you for sharing that. <laughs> I want to look into that now. Um, and along with the lesson planning, um, do you do some form of assessment so that you can keep track of student progress? What does that look like in an early language classroom for you? For me, okay, for my um, younger students, like kinder and first graders, um, it's more for me to see what's happening during class. Second and third graders, we actually have a, a tool at school that um, is called Seesaw, and I can actually give them a little bit more where they can actually listen to me, again, telling the story, and then I will stop and ask a question, you know, like comprehension questions, and they can answer individually, be like either by circling a picture um, so it's like a combination for them of like, for me, seeing about how they are performing, you know, during the class and also give them that specific assessment on, on a tool like CISO. So as we're listening to this, and I, I'm hoping that there are a lot of early language teachers that are excited for this topic, because when we talk about language, we tend to talk middle school and high school. So for shout out to all those early language teachers out there, uh, this is definitely your episode. But mm -hmm. there are middle school and high school teachers that are listening. And I don't want them to feel like this isn't useful information for them. So if we speak specifically to middle and high school teachers that are listening to this conversation, what do you think they can take from this, your approach with early language learners for their classroom? I, I definitely feel like, uh, I mean, whatever I'm doing here, I'm doing it at the level of my students, right? But this can be used for any level. When you're planning a lesson, you know, you have like your linguistic goals, right? You also have your cultural goals. Um, I, I also forgot to mention that when I'm planning my lessons, I make sure that I include a little bit of like movement activities. You can also do that, you know, with your older students. You can also listen to what's happening and what they are talking about and how you can bring that life into class. So it's definitely, I feel like we do the same, but of course I just craft it to the age group that I teach. 
So, yeah. So I think that you're very inspiring to teachers. So thank you for that. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, but I'm curious where you get your inspiration from when you're teaching and you're, you want to learn more about something. What is inspiring you? Um, I have, I say, mm-hmm. other teachers. I mean, I, I cannot lie. I, I don't get things like just, okay. oh, yeah, mm-hmm. it's just me. No, I, I other teachers. Um, in my previous years, you know, when I, because I moved to Austin and then came mm-hmm. back to Boston. Before moving to um, to Austin, um, I had a group of actually 10 teachers that we will just meet uh, once a month and get ideas from each other. So I can say that definitely um, other teachers inspire me. I have also through social media, you know, being able to connect with other teachers that I talk a lot and I actually call my friends now. But it's mostly like daily interaction about ideas uh, of even like it, not only about ideas, but also talking about like, oh, this happened today in my class. How do you think I could approach this and helping and supporting each other? But yeah, teachers inspire, get inspired by teachers and I get inspired by teachers. So yeah, those uh, learning networks, those teacher learning networks, which are mostly social media yeah. are, yeah, I I love like being on Twitter or something and you see what somebody did and, oh, I'll try that out or I tried this and it didn't work. Any suggestions on what I might do tomorrow? Right. (laughs) Yes, yes. Yeah. So this is the part of our little conversation where I want to pull the teacher curtain back a little (laughs) bit and get to know Carolina a little more than, you know, Senora Gomez. (laughs) Um, And I'm going to ask you just a couple of this or that questions okay. and just choose one. And if you want to say why, that's fine. But it just helps us to get to know you a little more. So the first question is spend time with one person, one good friend, or with a large group of friends. What would you choose? Uh, I think just one friend that I can mm-hmm. actually have the you know, time to just talk. And you're, you're, all, you're always getting to know anything and you Mm -hmm. always learn something it doesn't matter how Mm -hmm. you have been connected to that person so i think just one person okay yeah yeah maybe not always the same one but you like the connection of that one right okay very good um another one if you're watching a movie or you're reading a book and it comes to the end do you want the end to be final and clear Or are you okay with it being a little sort of in the gray area and not really done? I feel like I I need it to be clear. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I need things to be clear for me. (laughs) Yeah, I would absolutely agree with that. (laughs) I like uh, I like movies that it's done when it says the end. I want it to be the end. (laughs) That's it. Yes, yes. I don't want to be like going to it and thinking, but why did that happen? No, no, no. I want it clear for me. Yes. (laughs) Yes, yes. Um, And the last one is. If you want to try something new, whether it's a new activity or something in your classroom, do you like to take a lot of time to learn it or are you okay with just jumping right in and trying? Oh, can I be in like between? You can totally be anywhere you yeah, want. <laughs> yeah, I think it depends. If it requires a little of preparation, I think I want to take the time and, and mm-hmm. see how it works if it doesn't then i will jump in and then see if it doesn't work or <laughs> that's it right. excellent so i am very sure that there are teachers listening to us who would like to connect with you maybe be a part of your virtual learning groups that you're talking about or check out your website so what's the best place or uh, places where teachers can connect with you and learn more about you um, I ex- I have a blog, so if teachers want to go and, and, and read a little bit of, about what I share, my blog is a place um, to do so. And what's your blog address? Um, it's fun for Spanish teachers. Okay. Com. Yeah, all and of these will be in the show notes, just so everyone knows, but I just wanted to make sure we say it. Awesome. <laughs> and I have 
found that Instagram is actually a good place to connect mm-hmm. with other um, educators too. So uh, you can find me at Span for Spanish teachers there too. Mm-hmm. I'm also on Twitter. My handle is a little bit different. There is a Spanish together, but I do have to say that I'm a little bit less active there. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, I I love your Instagram stories. <laughs> oh, gracias. <laughs> I do love your Instagram stories. Uh, that's where I, sometimes you meet the puppets and other things like that that come up. Or sometimes uh, you see the turkeys that are walking around where I live. I mean, what? Turkeys in the city? <laughs> oh, I love that. Uh, so as we finish up here, I'm just wondering, can you leave us with a solid piece of advice about teaching younger students? Be flexible. Mm-hmm. As I said, you know, like you sometimes take the time to prep your lesson, but then you go to the classroom and then you find out that they are interested in something different. Mm-hmm. So be flexible and then find ways to connect that um, to what's happening in your classroom. Uh, so, yeah, always show up also with plan B and C mm-hmm. <laughs> because sometimes if plan A doesn't work, then you have mm-hmm. all the two other choices. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right there and yeah i mean be ready for you know like being spontaneous okay well thank you so much for your time today muchisima gracias for your time today oh de nada de nada um so i'm looking forward to everyone connecting with you and uh meeting your turkeys and puppets on social media as they go through (laughs) uh but thank you so much for your time today thank you thank you my pleasure What are your takeaways from that conversation with Carolina Gomez? I'm sure that you're inspired to pay close attention to what your students are talking about so that you can leverage those topics in your classroom. Be sure to check out the show notes so you can connect with Carolina. You'll also see a link to sign up for Talking Points, my weekly email newsletter with tips and resources for language teaching. There are also links to get in touch with me if you would like to work together either in person in your school or remotely. Talk to you soon. Bye for now. You've been listening to the World Language Classroom Podcast. Be sure to follow or subscribe wherever you're listening so you don't miss a single episode. Let's continue the conversation on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram at WL Classroom. You can also see over 250 blog posts about language teaching at, you guessed it, wlclassroom.com.